Can you shoot medics in war? If not, what happens if you do? In this video, our military experts delve into the origins and evolution of the legal protection afforded to combat medics. We also look at how the dangers and chaos of the battlefield ensure that these protections are often less than perfect in practice, as well as how these legal protections are increasingly under threat by 21st century technologies and the conduct of nations who have concluded that targeting medics is convenient to the accomplishment of military objectives. The origins of formal protections for medical personnel on the battlefield come with the first Geneva Convention, which began as an agreement exclusively among European states. This treaty was put into place in 1864. Article 6 of the document reads, Evacuations of wounded soldiers, together with the persons under whose directions they take place, shall be protected by absolute neutrality. Article 7 of the First Geneva Convention set the precedent for how to identify a combat medic. A distinctive and uniform flag shall be adopted for hospitals, ambulances and evacuations. It must, on every occasion, be accompanied by the national flag. An arm badge, brassard, shall be allowed for individuals neutralized, but the delivery thereof shall be left to military authority. The flag and the arm badge shall bear a red cross on a white ground. Other non-European states, which have since agreed to the First Geneva Convention, have adopted other symbols, like the Red Crescent or Red Star of David, in place of the cross, but the basic framework remains intact. A red on white pattern is prominent and easy to identify. Combat medics after 1864 wore the identifier on their helmets in addition to the armbands. The First Geneva Convention, which is purposed for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in the armed forces in the field, saw revisions in 1906, 1929 and 1949, which expanded the protections afforded to combat medics. Additional protocols were added to the First Geneva Convention in 1977. Among the modern protections for combat medics include the prohibition of taking them as prisoners of war in most cases. This protection reads, members of such personnel will not be considered as prisoners of war if they fall in the hands of the adversary. They must be freed unless the number of prisoners of war and their state of health require the contrary, in which case the medical personnel must be given the facilities and rights necessary to ensure the respect for medical ethics. And furthermore, if prisoners of war have medical expertise, they may be required to exercise medical function in the interest of other prisoners. In such cases, they have the same rights as the rest of the medical personnel. Additionally, on the battlefield, medical personnel cannot ever be punished for carrying out their duties as long as they are in line with medical ethics, a protection which also extends to civilians who may be carrying out such medical duties. Occupying powers also have the duty to ensure the maintenance of all medical facilities and activities and must allow medical practitioners within the territory they occupy to carry out their functions unimpeded. Protections for medics in the modern Geneva Convention are so broad that they are afforded almost complete freedom of movement as their duties require. Even soldiers who are not formally trained medics but who are temporarily assigned to medical functions such as stretcher bearers are afforded the full protection of regular combat medics by the terms of the first Geneva Convention. Further protections for medical personnel on the battlefield are specified in the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. The 1899 Convention reinforces the immunities outlined in the Geneva Convention of 1864 with regard to the treatment of sick and wounded. The 10th Treaty of the 1907 Hague Convention adapts the 1864 Geneva Convention's provisions to maritime warfare. The Second Geneva Convention later superseded the 1907 Treaty, but with the same basic protections for medics intact. It's understandable why the protection of combat medics would be so highly prioritized. The US Army estimates that about 20% of combat-related deaths are preventable if wounded soldiers can receive medical attention in time. As many as 50% of wounded soldiers die in combat because of severe blood loss, with 86% of combat fatalities occurring within half an hour of injury. Prompt medical attention and evacuation can prevent these things from occurring. Aside from the humanitarian reasons, these statistics remind us that there can be an element of mutual cynicism involved in protecting medics. Wounded soldiers who are saved have a chance of returning to the front and remaining assets for their country during wartime. Dead soldiers have seen the end of their usefulness. Historically, combat medics usually did not carry weapons, a fact which was in line with their role of being officially recognized non-combatants. However, modern medics do carry weapons. They are given the same basic training as all other soldiers to navigate the hazards of the battlefield. 
This basic training includes weapons training. In a 2014 interview with Business Insider, a medic in the British Army, who did not wish to be identified, described and showed off the equipment he carried. His gear included a 5.56mm SA-80A2 rifle, a 9mm Sig Sauer P226 pistol, and plenty of grenades. Although medics are not sent to participate in combat missions, if they do fire on the enemy in any offensive way, they give up the legal protections that the first Geneva Convention assigns them. They carry the appropriate means to defend themselves and their patients. This is where a little history is in order. The modern practice for medics legally being allowed to carry weapons originates in World War II. Prior to then, there was no explicit statement on the matter, but the general practice was that medical practitioners should not carry weapons, lest they be blurred with regular combat soldiers. During the Second World War, medics did not often carry weapons, lest they lose the protections afforded to them by the Geneva and Hague Conventions. Some of them carried sidearms, however, and this proved the start of a trend that the war would reinforce. Despite its brutality elsewhere, Nazi Germany was a signatory to the First Geneva Convention and generally respected enemy personnel who wore clear markers of a combat medic, at least on the Western Front. On the Eastern Front, things were different. Neither the Russian Empire nor its successor state, the Soviet Union, were parties to the First Geneva Convention at the time. And while the Russian Empire did sign the Hague Convention, it came with reservations. The Soviet Union was also never confirmed to be a party to the Hague Conventions. As a result of this and the Lebensraum living space policy, where the inhabitants of Eastern Europe were viewed as undesirables that needed to be dispossessed of their land for colonizing Germans, Nazi Germany did not differentiate Soviet medics from other soldiers, either as combatants or as prisoners of war. Naturally, the Soviet Union treated German medics the same way. The Japanese did not have much regard for medics either, despite being a party to the First Geneva Convention. Japanese soldiers often deliberately targeted medics to cause more havoc in their enemy's forces and demoralize the wounded men under their care. The practice was so widespread that Japanese soldiers tended to shout medic in English to specifically draw them into their sights. Unfortunately for the medics, their prominent insignia made them very easy for Japanese soldiers to target. The protection these symbols were supposed to afford had instead become the most dangerous thing that a medic could carry. This is why as the Pacific War went on, medics and corpsmen removed their distinctive uniforms, looking and acting more like regular soldiers. These functions included their being armed and fighting side by side with the regular soldiers. As we've seen, these acts violated the Geneva Convention and therefore forfeited the protection afforded to medics. However, in practice, those protections had been made moot long before. As a result of the experience on the Eastern Front and Pacific theaters in World War II, modern medics and corpsmen are trained to carry weapons and are legally permitted to defend themselves and their patients if they are targeted. As recent conflicts tended to involve terror groups which have little regard to the Geneva Convention, it's unsurprising that the famous medic identifiers, the prominent symbols on armbands and helmets, have been used less frequently in modern wars. The final time they were seen in prominent use by the United States was during the Vietnam War, but unsurprisingly, the easy visibility of these symbols made medics ripe targets there too, so the classic red cross on a white background was dropped. Much as officers began to conceal themselves with less prominent uniforms in the 20th century in response to the improved accuracy of small arms and artillery that deliberately targeted them, medics were starting to conceal themselves as they too had begun to be deliberately targeted in modern wars. Modern medics in most armies are now difficult to identify on sight. The only sure way to tell is by how they act. This lack of visibility increasingly makes medics appear and sometimes act more like regular combat soldiers, not just on the front lines, but in support roles too. The British medic interviewed in Business Insider mentioned that in addition to carrying his medical equipment that can weigh between 50 and 80 pounds, he also needed to carry extra ammunition. Such ammunition included 51 mm mortar rounds. As medics are starting to act more like regular soldiers, the same is also true in reverse. The return of state-based competition and the rise of anti-access area denial strategies mean that in a conflict with a peer or near-peer adversary, evacuating wounded soldiers to get treatment might not be as easy as it was during the War on Terror. Lieutenant General Sean B. McFarland, who observed medical evacuation practices in Afghanistan, warned in 2017 that in an A2AD environment, Medivac might not be coming, at least not in time to save the lives of wounded soldiers. Therefore, he said, regular frontline soldiers would need to learn how to provide care at the point of injury, 
and learn how to use the necessary medical equipment to save their wounded comrades' lives. In 2017, Tactical Combat Casualty Care TC3, training kits were being sent out to selected brigade combat teams in order to train regular soldiers in the tasks that medics usually do. These kits have mannequins that mimic human breathing, bleeding pulses, and traumatic amputations. With these pieces of equipment in hand, a team of three medics can train 30 regular soldiers in common care methods, such as clearing obstructions to breathing, stopping traumatic bleeding, and chest decompressions. As part of a more comprehensive system of training, some soldiers have gone out with paramedics in major cities like New York to witness the treatment of injuries like gunshot wounds as a way to acclimate them to what it's like to deal with trauma on a routine basis. While these experiences cannot mimic all of the types of wounds seen on a battlefield, they can get soldiers used to responding quickly to trauma and instruct them on how to deliver aid in stressful conditions. Because field hospitals are also typically targeted, McFarlane said they might need to be broken up into smaller, more modular units in the future. In a contest with a near-peer adversary that has access to precision weaponry, this doctrine becomes more important. Medical facilities would almost certainly be targeted in a modern state-based conflict, and we can see a preview of what international warfare in the 21st century might be like with the way the Russians have conducted themselves over the past 10 years. For example, Russia has frequently targeted hospitals in its campaigns in Syria and Ukraine, despite the Soviet Union's accession to the Geneva Convention in 1960 and its subsequent accession to the Convention's Protocol 2 in 1989. By February 2023, nearly one in ten hospitals in Ukraine had been damaged by some kind of Russian attack. Medical workers in the country have also been targeted. In the first year of the war, nearly 200 medical workers were killed, injured, kidnapped or arrested in a study done by a collaboration of human rights and healthcare-related NGOs. It's also notable that Russia withdrew from Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention in October 2019. This protocol authorizes the investigation of alleged war crimes against civilians. In justifying his decision to withdraw from Protocol 1, Putin claimed that the International Commission which conducts the investigations has effectively failed to carry out its functions since 1991. Russia's withdrawal from at least part of the Geneva Convention sets a precedent and in the war in Ukraine, we have seen other actions which harken back to the treatment of medical facilities and personnel in the most brutal fighting of World War II. In September 2022, Ukrainian combat medics claimed they were also being targeted on an individual basis. In an interview with Vice, one Ukrainian combat medic who was identified only as Andriy mentioned that while on patrol, he and his squad came upon a bullet-riddled car with three dead soldiers inside. The fourth man was showing signs of life. Since these were all comrades, Andriy attempted to apply treatment to the wounded man, but his commander stopped him before he could do so. The prescient commander found a booby trap grenade in the hand of the wounded man, leaving the squad no choice but to retreat and leave their injured comrade behind. Other booby trap attacks include leaving grenades under dead bodies, an act designed to target medics and people collecting casualties. Both of these kind of booby traps are considered war crimes. As in World War II and Vietnam, red crosses on medical personnel and vehicles make them easy targets and have invited attacks in Ukraine. In the early days of the war, Andriy claimed that he and his colleagues, who had marked themselves with red crosses, were deliberately targeted. As a consequence, medics in Ukraine no longer wear the insignia, nor do they paint it on their vehicles. Now Ukrainian medics attire themselves similarly to their counterparts in other countries. While this has made them harder to identify, it has by no means left them safe. According to Andriy, the Russians study our behavior, they study the way we collaborate, and they study every action we perform. They know that after every massive artillery shootout, medics' cars arrive and you can hit them with artillery. The arrival of drones on the battlefield has made medics more vulnerable. Russian drone operators have singled out medical evaluation vehicles and medics who treat casualties after artillery bombardments or engagements with small arms. As drones allow easy surveillance, Russian forces have used them to monitor troops carrying medical kits and backpacks who exit vehicles and mill among the fallen after a period of shelling or small arms combat. These medical personnel and their vehicles are then targeted either with loitering munitions or artillery strikes. These actions create a force multiplication effect for the Russians. A dead medic or wrecked ambulance means that many more Ukrainian soldiers will lose their lives in the absence of proper medical care and evacuation. 
These casualties and vehicles are also much harder to replace. By September 2022, Andre was relying on volunteers to aid them with medical evacuation because so many evacuation vehicles and ambulances had been destroyed. Even in the face of a successful evacuation, the danger is far from over. The Russians have placed landmines on evacuation routes for ambulances and often targeted the vehicles with artillery strikes, hoping to create even more destruction among medical personnel and destruction among their vehicles. Ukrainian medics have also reported that Russian tanks fire on ambulances as well. Targeting medical personnel and equipment helps Russia win the war of attrition that has developed in Ukraine. Less access to medical care means more dead Ukrainian soldiers. Since Russia has a population of about three times as many people as Ukraine, Russia can take more losses, while each loss of a Ukrainian soldier is more difficult to replace. The math of attrition has led Russia to adopt a cynical calculation that it's better to ignore its Geneva Convention obligations for the sake of victory on the battlefield. The experiences in Ukraine have tended to confirm the remarks General McFarlane made on the vulnerability of traditional medical practices in modern war. Medivac will be more difficult in the face of peer or near-peer warfare defined by artillery, missiles and drones, and not the low-level explosive devices seen in the War on Terror. Such weapons create what Dr. Aaron Epstein calls mass casualty events. Epstein is one of the authors of the extensive report on the experiences of medics in Ukraine for the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. The study concluded that the United States must be prepared to treat the wounded far closer to the front line and protect them for longer periods of time in the face of much more difficult evacuation conditions, strengthening the idea that all modern soldiers must be prepared to apply medical aid of some kind. The Geneva Conventions are the only series of treaties that have the distinction of being entered into by all countries. However, in practice, their provisions have been ignored by many of the countries that are parties to them. Russia's withdrawal from Protocol 1 set a precedent that if necessary, certain countries will abandon the Geneva Conventions for the sake of their interests, whether formally or not. The conduct of the wars in Syria and Ukraine show that in a 21st century international conflict, which would involve states like Russia, China, and their partners like North Korea and Iran, traditional protections for medical personnel afforded by the first Geneva Convention might become increasingly irrelevant. The Geneva Conventions were expressions of the growing power of liberal political ideology around the world, but the resurgence of authoritarianism is increasingly challenging this ideology and revealing the anarchical nature of international relations. As there is no true lawmaking body in the international arena, all treaties require the accession of self-interested states. For a time, the first Geneva Convention and protection of medics seemed like it would be in the interest of the signatory parties. But that is increasingly no longer so. Long before this point, medics were being blurred into the ranks of normal soldiers, and the trends of rising, anti-humanitarian, authoritarian powers and new technology on the battlefield might mean that protections afforded to medics become as moot in the future as they were before the first Geneva Convention. What do you think the future of the combat medic will be? Will all soldiers be forced to become medics of some kind? Will the trend of ignoring the Geneva and Hague Conventions on the battlefield continue? Make sure to let us know in the comments, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.